Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Antonio Bicchi. He's a senior scientist at IIT and also a professor at the University of Pisa and an adjunct professor at the Arizona State University. Antonio has received many distinctions and awards. Um, for instance, he is an IEEE fellow and he also uh, received the IEEE Saridis Leadership Award. I don't think I exaggerate if I say that Antonio is one of the most well-known researchers in robotics, both in terms of contributions to uh, robotics, for instance, by founding the World Haptics Conference and also by establishing the IEEE Robotics and Automation Letters. He has also very broad research interests um, centering around obviously robotics and intelligent machines, control engineering, haptics, and soft robotics. And then if you combine haptics and soft robotics, you get soft robot hands. That's probably the thing I know Antonio best for the, uh, the PISA hands. He has a very broad perspective on intelligence that's not only about learning and algorithms like uh, this conference focuses on, but also about physical intelligence. So intelligence embodied in the structure of systems. And then finally also the idea of interfacing humans and machines to make the joint system even more intelligent. And now I'm looking very much forward to uh, your keynote and uh, hearing how these various forms of intelligence can help us to cope with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you have any questions, please uh, use the Q&A functionality at the bottom uh, of Zoom to post those questions. Antonio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jens. Let me share my screen. Um, and let me start with this presentation. It is a true privilege and a pleasure to give this lecture to to this conference on robot learning, uh, which uh, aims directly at the heart of some of the hardest problems we face in robotics. Um, as you know, I'm not exactly uh, a learning, computational learning person, but I will try to give you a perspective, which I hope you will find relevant at least. The um, This year has been, uh, and, and still is, uh, unfortunately, uh, a very difficult one. Perhaps we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel now. Uh, if it is so, it will be because technology will be part of the solution. During this year, we had motivation and, and also time to ask ourselves, what can our specific robotics technology do for people? Like, really, not hypothetically, with our robotics, uh, community in Italy, we decided it was best to ask. We did uh, many interviews, uh, questionnaires. We went to hospitals, talked to people in the retirement houses, and we found that people have now ever more trust and confidence and expectations in technology than they did before. This places even higher responsibility on our work. So what have we learned? Um, the, the results of all these uh, investigation will be reported in, in journals and, and conferences uh, specifically, but let me summarize some of the results. So what people really wanted to most was to be able to stay in touch and help their families and friends and to remove risks from work in dangerous environments, reduce fatigue and boredom in manual jobs, while still keeping people's skills at the center of work. So these were, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the foremost important things to many people. And in a world we need, I think, to make robots that are useful and usable for people, for real people, normal people, not just us, not just those who can program and code computers. Let me give an example in the domain of hand, which is of course something that I'm very um, interested in. This is a dexterous hand, an example of a hand that uh, can be built uh, today is not too complicated with 3D printing. And, and you can see some of the operations that uh, are made, can be made with the hand. And some, some of those are interesting, but uh, you know, this, take, uh, this took a long time 
few thousands of lines of code to make, nothing that a normal pencil could do, uh, and nothing that can be done in very short time to adapt to a new situation or new need. If you compare with a human hand, a human hand can do incredible things. It's a very complicated uh, system. It has 19 degrees of freedom. Um, it has 40 muscles. All of them are used even in the simplest application, like uh, uncapping a jar of marmalade. Uh, but uh, we do not think of any individual muscle while we use it. No joint is programmed. So we should reach in robotics a level where we can do similarly, use our robots without thinking of them. So the talk is about uh, moving from robot, human robot interaction to a uh, step further human robot integration. Let me give a little background on, on the, the theories that are being discussed and they're behind here. Um, the, first of all, I'm no longer so interested in robots to replace humans. I'm more interested in robots to integrate with humans. Uh, and that is because I think that no robot or human can do alone what they could do together. So we can do much more if we integrate. And the question is, how can we merge humans and machines in a symbiosis that is more powerful, more nimble, intelligent than the sum of its parts? If you look at the theories of mind that are around in philosophy, then you have theories of, the, of a mind that is uh, school bound, completely contained in our central nervous systems, in the neurons in our brain. And that leads to a, a, an approach to AI, which has been very fruitful under many regards, which is able to solve problems like chess, checkers, Go recently. It is, uh, it is going to a replacement paradigm. And in some cases, it's very useful, of course, very important. It's changing our lives. But if you want to <clears throat> go a step further, then it has been recognized since long that the mind really has to do also with the body and that many of the processes that we uh, consider as intelligent are given by the relationship of our central nervous system with our body through the interaction of afferent and afferent uh, signals that go in and out our, our cortex. And this is no news. This goes back to Moravec's paradigm uh, and, and, uh, and all the discussion that has been. More recently, the extended mind proposal by Andy Clark and others has found uh, some success. The extended mind theory basically posits that uh, intelligence is not even limited to the body, but it has to encompass also the environment in the sense that all our actions are mediated through the environment in uh, sensations and sensations are generated by our action on the environment. So this is uh, something that has been uh, theoretically posed by Clark and others, but has been later uh, confirmed by finding that, uh, for instance, in this paper, I like to cite a sensing with tools extends somatosensory processing beyond the body. It's a very interesting paper that shows how <clears throat> uh, we incorporate in our own brain the effect of actions that we have on the environment. And this is indeed also something that was uh, uh, seen before. So there is a classical in human robot interaction, which is teleoperation. In teleoperation, we, you basically um, cut the link between the, the human body and the environment, and you pose in between uh, an interface and a robot that eventually ultimately interacts with the environment. And the idea here is that in this loop, you have to make uh, expectations that the human has out of his actions match what the human has learned to be the normal response of the environment to that action. And that is uh, beautifully described in an early paper by Roland Johansson and others, where he says that the CNS monitors a specific 
uh, expected peripheral sensory events and use these to directly apply control signals that are appropriate for the current task and its phase. And previous experience with the object at hand or similar objects is used to adjust the model commands parametrically in advance of the movement. So we rely a lot on this pre-planned learned map of actions into expected sensations and we use those all along in our operations. So the beginnings of robotics were in uh, teleoperation. So here, for instance, in 1959 is the first teleoperator that uh, was used, uh, developed in Italy, but still used today, incredibly. I just saw it a uh, few uh, months ago. In England, in the torus where the plasma, the, the joint European torus where the plasma is uh, formed for maintenance of that torus. And this was already a system that had uh, very interesting features, as you can see here. And since those times, teleoperation and exoskeletons, this is 1967, uh, were at the core of, uh, of the starting research in robotics. You see teleoperations on the left, exoskeletons on the right, Hardman and Nandiman. Some of these were devices that are look scary today, but teleoperation has been progressing. And uh, it's still today very useful. For instance, in surgery, all our surgical systems are teleoperated. Disaster response in space applications, underwater, or other general purpose applications. So when you do teleoperation, you, we are aware that a classical scheme may fail because of an imperfect transparency of the master-slave link. For instance, if there are delays, jitter or lag into the communication between the haptic interface of the driver and the robot, then you might feel uh, disconnected and instability might, might happen. But there is also another reason why this might not work because the robot interacts with the environment in, in a way that is not ecologically realistic and does not bring back the expected information, the expected sensation that the user would have from that action. In some sense, this was known already in the old times. These are sketches from 67 that show what a robot would why a robot would fail, because basically it's too rigid and lacks sensing. So these are, I, I thought it were interesting that those problems are basically still the same that we have or uh, today. We are trying to work on, on what we call a symbionic architecture that tries to move a little bit further. So what, what are the needed components here as, are that we of course need a better a, a good interface between the interface and the robot, a good communication there. But we also need a very natural interaction of the robot with the environment so that we can match the expected sensations. And these expected perceptual outputs are mediated by the environment and by the physical interaction of the environment with the robot. Of course, it is important to notice that nature and our own body is soft. So the mechanical interaction with the environment is determined by the impedance of the two systems. And the impedance in nature is typically soft. It's also variable in time. Sometimes we are softer, sometimes we are stiffer. But elephants, although they cannot play Go, they can do many interesting things with a soft trunk. Soft robotics has been developing rapidly in recent years. And you see that there are robots now that uh, basically take inspiration from all the levels of different uh, evolution in, in nature. So uh, second part is about uh, robot processes that can be seen as integration of robotics and people. Let me start again from this picture showing the human hand grasping robots and compare it with the situation that most robotic most uh, uh, prosthetic, prosthetic hands have today. So uh, if you want to do something naturally, you need a dimensionality of the, of the robot, which is comparable to the, to the human. And the upper limb in human has 30 degrees of freedom. 
plus it can vary the stiffness. A robot hand for, for prosthetics is typically one to five degrees of freedom. But even if we had so as many independent degrees of freedom as the human hand, how can we ask a user to program such complexity? An important observation that, was, uh, that can be made is that humans do not really control the tiny details of grasping, but we let the hand do it. For instance, here is the human uh, grasping a hologram and showing that the grasp is not completely accurate. We just go there, but we let the hand adapt to the object. And another observation that came from neuroscience uh, a few years ago is that the human do not control their hands at the joint level or the muscle level, but rather at a more abstract level of synergies that are uh, basically uh, principal components of motion that also find, we also found that there are relative <clears throat> correlates of this organization in the neural cortex of the, of the humans. So the idea of having some intelligence in the hand is sketched in this, in this graph here, where you see that the geometric hand, the, the wire mesh is controlled by these uh, uh, synergies, while the real hand is attracted towards that mesh, but is repulsed by the object, so that in the end, the shape of the hand depends on the object, very much like uh, you could observe in this hologram grasping where the planned motion of the, of the human was tricked to go inside the object because it didn't find the physics of the object to correct the position and generate the forces. So we have done uh, in the past uh, this uh, uh, PISA IIT soft 10 that uses 19 joints and one input from the user and is soft and adaptable according to these principles. Let me show again very briefly some of the things that the hand can do through the intelligence that is embedded uh, in the hand itself. And as you can see, all the 19 degrees of freedom can be used, but the control from the user is very, very simple. So very recently we participated with the hand uh, this is Maria, that is really a designer, uh, industrial designer for in our team, but is also a user of the hand that participated in the Cybertron last week. Um, images are not uh, of this competition, but uh, she ended up second. What I wanted to show is not uh, uh, is not this, but some of the uh, candid peaks that we took after or during the race. Uh, here is Maria and Rosa, another pilot, uh, using their hands in normal life and having this uh, softness of the hand, this integration of the robot hand with their body made them feel much more natural. So here is, for instance, uh, Rosa making massage to Cristina Piazza and enjoying a little bit. So what is interesting is to see here, for instance, Maria that uh, uh, uses the hand for uh, just making a phone call or for opening a bottle. And if you focus a little bit on this bottle opening and you compare with the human hand, you realize that softness and this intelligence of the, of the synergies put in the hand uh, could make some impact in making things simpler. We are now going beyond that in a project that is called Natural Bionics, where we really want to create a fully integrated symbiotic replacement of missing or damaged parts of the human body uh, with artificial limbs so that the user will feel and command them as a true part of her or his body. And here the question, the point is that uh, a collaboration with a surgeon, Oscar Asman from University of Vienna and Dario Farina, a neuroengineer from Imperial College, the surgeon will make uh, an implant uh, of the nerves that used to go to the hand into a uh, area of the stump where he will recreate an image, a sensory motor image of the missing hand that he calls manunculus. And from there, we, we will get the information through Dario Farina's algorithm to command the human, the, the robot hand. But what is important in, and crucial here is that we need to have uh, 
that the person will give model plans that also contain a sensory expectation. And when we send out this model command, then we have to make sure that the robot hand gives back a physical interaction that generates the appropriate feedback. So that's why soft and uh, uh, robotics is important for, for that part. Now, let me move to a second part of human robot integration, where I will be talking about avatars. Avatars can be seen as evolutions of exoskeletons in some sense. Exoskeletons are, uh, have been popular here and there in, in, in robotics history. Um, they suffer a little bit from the encumbrance and weight. But if you think a minute, uh, while you are there, why not uh, take your distance from the, from the exoskeleton and just uh, make it move uh, alone in the remote or dangerous environment. So um, basically our approach to, to avatars is to make an interface of the human that is as lightweight, non-invasive as possible, make the person feel just normal and simply make him live and act in another space. Of course, it takes a lot of intelligence for the avatar to make that possible and especially for making the avatar interact with the environment in a natural way so that the operator sees and acts in the environment as if he were there or she. The pilot station consists of very simple devices that are wearable. We do not use exoskeletons for the um, replication of uh, sensations to the, to the user because we value uh, that uh, this scheme will allow normal people to use uh, this technology. And of course, we need uh, to measure the intention of the human uh, with different means. For instance, hand pose, hand gestures, arm stiffness. And that is important uh, for the rest of this talk. So for instance, in this, uh, in this short video, we show how uh, a student can move uh, the two arms around and also has arm bands that measure his uh, EMG to make uh, stiffness changeable. Then he can switch to a mode where only one hand commands the center point of the two robots as if it were a unique big hand. Of course, this is uh, programmed in the, in the robot. And by this kind of uh, uh, control, you can easily swap between one mode or the other. You can easily do things that would be very difficult to program, very lengthy to program. You can imagine how many lines of code it would take to write a program that can take a ball out of a box as we are doing here. Now the person is moving back to a single hand control. This is Michele Maimeri, a collaborator in our group. Taking the ball out. You can appreciate that the softness of the hands is helping him a lot in this operation. taking the ball out and then I will stop here, but it will open the next box, put the ball there and then shake the box around. That was the task. Of course, you can do other things. What, uh, what we uh, really would like to see is that these operations at some point are learned by the robot. And we will come back to this point. So here is the robot that is operated from far away the robot now has a head that also follows the uh, gaze of the uh, of the operator that is in another room or in another city and uh, you see that you can interact with the environment exchanging forces with the environment taking a book out of a shelf this has applications in remote working and physical smart working is something that uh, we have found is very desirable today so uh, in this case, we are operating from uh, three different cities, a robot that is our uh, little uh, uh, 
wheeled humanoid, alter ego is called, he is operated in a data center where maintenance is needed. The person is in another city. The person now has uh, all the experience that is needed to operate maintenance in a data center, which is something that uh, uh, takes a lot of training, but it does not need to be there. And the robot so goes around in the, uh, in the data center and searches for the cabinet to serve. Visually inspects. And uh, soon we'll reach a cabinet. Let me see if I can make it. Here is an operation that uh, has been classically difficult for, for, for robots, which is opening a door. But you see that a mixture of the autonomy in the robot, the balance control, the softness in the hands and in the body, and the high level control from the person, which basically just tells the robot what to do, is enough to obtain these, uh, the task. And later on, the robot will do the, uh, the rest. Here is another application of the same idea, a person away from home with a person at home that needs care and you see that the robot can tend to the pet go meet the main man bring medical medicines or food to the person in the bed so we believe that these kind of applications are today of course possible they are not too difficult and they they will be very useful to normal people a person can be can operate a robot without any training. The robot just does what the person does. So um, we believe that this is uh, uh, something that every you know, group can do now with the technology that we have. Of course, there is something to do with the autonomy of the robot. There is some, uh, 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 there is some non-trivial details in here, but basically, these are things that may make the perspective of a personal robot possible. No need for programming here. Now, the last part of this talk is, does now integration make programming any easier? Can we really make so that uh, we can have robots that learn from what we do? And of course, yes, we can, but we also know how we often do. So for instance, take some of the experiments that we have been, we have seen in the last, in the past few years, just to learn to grasp some objects. Uh, it took uh, hundreds or thousands of trials and trials and trials, very costly, very cumbersome. And then you change the scene a little bit, you have to start learning again. If you compare this with what takes to teach a children, a child, it's very, it's very discouraging. So of course, children learn from demonstration. Uh, they imitate a lot. And when we teach a children, we do not need to give thousand examples. There are important mirroring mechanisms in our uh, neural control system that enormously facilitate the learning. And uh, we believe that leveraging on human robot integration and symbionic control may be a way to make teaching by demonstration even easier than it's been so far. 
So um, this is recent work that Gianluca Lentini, a student uh, of mine, has done and published in ICRA. It's basically the idea of uh, uh, using the robots as avatars and just extracting the knowledge that goes there, just like a kid would do. So the learning methods are simple, but the effect is uh, interesting. The fact uh, that enables uh, uh, relatively good uh, results is the fact that the robot mirrors the person so that the, the person can teach the robot in a very natural way and the robot is uh, facilitated in learning. So the first task is, uh, is uh, object sorting. So the person shows that uh, rolls of tape have to go in that position on the hook. Once it has shown that only once, then the robot can generalize from any position the same task to that hook. And of course, it can do more. So if the hook is moved and the objects are moved, still the plan is the same. So it can be repeated easily. Now, if different objects are placed in the same scene, well, the robot has, does not know how to do that and calls the operator back to teach him. So the glue bottle goes into the yellow holder while the brass connector should be placed in the blue box. That should be enough. If you tell a boy like this, Every girl or boy can, can do that very easily. So the robot does. If you look carefully at the scene, you will see that the compliance of the hand and the robots plays a role in forgiving little errors that happen in the scene, just like probably the human's compliance helps us solve our task without paying too much attention. So you could see that the robot uh, solved this uh, simple puzzle very effectively. And interestingly, once the plan is learned, you can execute it faster because robots are good at that. So you just push it faster. This is twice as fast as the speed where uh, at which the robot has been taught. There are also other things you can do. Here is a very simple, this is a very recent video where uh, the robot self discovers branches in the program. So the first, uh, based on the visual appearance of this object, uh, the object is placed somewhere. Then another object with this virtually very similar visual appearance is a uh, different weight though is placed by the operator in a different position. So the robot starts with the same visual appearance, but then finds a different perception from his uh, kinesthetic sensors, the force and, and position sensors. So it generates a branch in his program. And now it uh, doesn't know what situation he will find, but he finds it uh, that it is the heavy case and it will do this while from why if the weight is found to be lighter, it will go to the right position there. So it's nothing extraordinary to people like you in learning, but I think it's still somehow uh, interesting how simple methods can work effectively, probably thanks to the interface. A final piece uh, that I wanted to show again uh, very recently is uh, very recently done is how you can teach interaction and teaching interaction can be too hard. So, for instance, using a, a stiff robot to do the classical peg in hole, you can definitely demonstrate the task, bringing the peg into the hole. But when you replicate it with a robot in complete autonomy now, the robot will miss the point because the, uh, the box will be in a different position in general. It will not be exactly accurate. 
and it cannot adapt because too high forces will be generated in this tight pegging hole task. So position will be wrong and consequently the force will be, will be wrong. But can also be too soft. If you use now a control of the robot that is very, very soft through software uh, control of this robot, then you can still under uh, teleoperation can still operate the robot so that it achieves the goal. But then when you try to replicate that autonomously, then you will find that uh, uh, it doesn't work. In this case, it doesn't work because simply it would take more force to push the bag down the hole than it can be achieved with a very soft robot. So what do humans do? Humans adapt their impedance during a task such as this so that they are soft at the beginning and they get stiffer when it is time to go down. So we should teach impedance as well. And the idea is that uh, we can do that because we can learn impedance from the, the human. So we measure the surface CMGs from the human while doing the task. And we realize that uh, it does change it, uh, the, the impedance, the operator changes his impedance. So it teaches and we measure the stiffness of the person, of the person's arm. And then we replicate both the position that has been learned and the impedance that has been learned in the different phases of the task and we synchronize. And the effect is that the task now can be replicated autonomously in a very effective way, accurately replicating both positions and forces. And if you look at how the stiffness has been changing during time, you will see that in the blue line, you have the measurements that were made on the human arm in teaching. And the human arm, of course, you see some noise due to EMG, but uh, the autonomous application is just a filtered version of the human. And then you have a phase where you have adaptability, very soft uh, teaching and execution, and then again stiff in the final push phase. So with this, I think I will conclude my talk and I'll be uh, very happy to get any, to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for the attention. These are uh, some of the main collaborators in, uh, in this work that I would like to uh, thank very much for their tremendous work. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio, for this very uh, inspiring talk. Um, so I'm getting a few questions in the chat. Daryl Pinto is asking, uh, what's the name of this paper, the one on um, imitation learning? And now I lost the chat. And then a follow-up question, what priors are encoded in the mirroring that allows it to learn with one demonstration? Uh, what priors? Um, it depends on, on the task, uh, for instance, in the object sorting, uh, we know that uh, uh, objects are on, on, a, on a plane and that uh, there is a vertical wall in front. And that's all that is assumed. In the pegging hole, uh, I think we know that there is a, a peg and a hole. These are the, the structures that you have to, that you have to consider. The, uh, some of these, I think, can be removed. Um, is not is not uh, strictly uh, determine the amount of uh, of the priors that we that we need for doing these tasks. Okay, thanks a lot. Catherine also had a question. Maybe you can just unmute and ask directly. Yeah, hi, Antonio. Thank you for the beautiful talk. I really like your approach of having humans and body robot and teleoperate demonstrations. 
I wanted to ask, uh, you're doing all these human scale teleoperation. The robot has pretty similar capabilities to the operator. Do you recommend anything special if uh, the robot, say, is only very slow or it has fewer degrees of freedom from the human? Uh, how far can you push this and yeah, what else do you recommend? Uh, so, so if I understand correctly, the question is, um, what if the robot is much simpler than the human, right? Uh, slower has lower capabilities the human has a very capable arms and hands so do we need does the robot need all these capabilities or could your methods also work if the robot was somewhat simpler or less capable um yes we we do assume that there is some that there is some mirroring effect and we believe it is rather important so if the map between my hand and the robot hand is uh, uh acceptable in some in some psychological sense we think it makes things uh, very easy of course if we have uh, so it, it doesn't take to have a six degrees of freedom arm for each arm it doesn't really take to have a completely um, anthropomorphic uh, robot uh, hands can be as simple as our hand instead of uh, you know the really nimble hand that we have but it does help that we have some resemblance. Uh, so what exact uh, level of resemblance we need to do things, I don't think we have, I am in a position to, to, um, to speculate. It's, uh, uh, and it is interesting. One further thing that I should say is that uh, we are using, that I didn't probably pay too much attention, uh, in, in during the talk, I didn't bring too, so much attention, is that we also receive feedback from, from the scene. And although that is not uh, uh, kinesthetic, we do not receive forces from the outcome, from the, from the, uh, from the outcome of interaction, we do receive uh, um, wearable information on the fingertips at times and on the skin on the um, of, uh, of the person. And those uh, features are important also to replicate that uh, uh, closed loop that I was mentioning before. So some of, of the work that people have been doing in haptics, people like you and others are very important here. Wearable haptics. So now we have one final question from uh, Ken Goldberg. Very inspiring talk, Antonio, as always. As pure teleoperation can be slow, what are your thoughts on supervised control? What are the human controls? What were the human controls intermittently? In particular, is it possible to learn optimal switching policies between human and autonomous control? Yeah, this is exactly what we we are thinking to do. If you if you look at what uh, what our robot do, um, I wouldn't call this teleoperation any anymore. It's really um, it's really shared autonomy uh, to a level where the robot uh, the robot can be operated completely autonomously. Um, these robots, and of course we are doing a supervision. So what the the Person tells is basically now is is basically go grab that objects, uh, and the robot goes and grab the objects, and then it can do that again and again. So it's not teleoperation in the sense of uh, uh, one to one mapping of uh, bits uh, each round. Um, of course, I don't know if the optimal switching policy, but a switching policy between supervision and autonomy is important and in the view that we have for the last task that we showed is that uh, you can do something with a robot and once he has learned to do that set of objects or that task then you can leave it alone for some time while you do something else if you want to program another robot or if you want to just enjoy your time you, you you can leave it do until it calls you back because it finds something that it doesn't know how to solve. And then, and then you pay attention to it again. That is the idea. So I'm, I think I'm perfectly in line with uh, what Ken uh, suggests. Uh, I, I think that is the right way to go. Thanks a lot. We're perfectly on time. Let's give Antonio one big round of virtual applause for this very inspiring talk. 
and I now hand over to Brandon Englert for the uh, first um, paper session. Thank you very much, 